Well, on to the final lecture on Rome. Whew, this has been a long unit. Marcus Aurelius was the last of the so-called good emperors. Uh, he was known for his philosophical writings as well as his wise rule, or that is until the end, when he decided that his son, Commodus, was the most qualified candidate for emperor. Uh, he was, as it turns out, pretty catastrophically wrong. Uh, and with Marcus Aurelius' death began the decline of the status of emperor and of the empire. The statue is notable in part because it survived, apparently because the emperor was mistaken for the Christian Constantine, and therefore this bronze work was spared the usual fate of being melted down to make cannons. Uh, but the statue is also significant because of its departure from the classical tradition, and that's going to be the theme of this last lecture. As things fall apart in Rome, the classical tradition also fractures and is replaced uh, by a tradition that seems simpler and in some ways cruder, but is also going to make the transition to Christian art uh, and a whole new form of Western art. So note that Marcus Aurelius is too big for his horse, which is another indication that hierarchy of scale is returning to art. Another important departure from the classical style is the emperor's careworn face. Now, we've seen verism before in Roman art. Notice that there's kind of a uh, oscillation back and forth between the two. It's not a trend just in one uh, direction. But just as the Greek empire under more strain moved toward more realistic and emotional portraiture in Hellenistic art, so an empire facing the threat of decline produced less idealized portraits. So this is another veristic period. But beyond that, uh, the veristic portraits of the Republican Romans look stern and old. These uh, sculptures, I think, go beyond that. They look discouraged. So another change as Rome moved into the late empire stage was uh, that there was a movement away from cremation to burial and with it the creation of more carved sarcophagi. So the subject of this frieze is the mythological story of Orestes, but the gods were given the faces of actual deceased Romans, so more of this role-playing we've talked about before. Uh, this frieze also employs the technique of continuous narration. We actually see Orestes appear several times, uh, slaying his mother and her lover to avenge his father, for example, and taking refuge at Apollo's sanctuary in Delphi. Uh, a cultural divide was also opening in this period between the Eastern and Western Empire. Eastern sarcophagi had carvings on all four sides because they stood in the center of the burial chamber. Uh, Western sarcophagi were put into niches, so there was no point in carving the back, and they were just carved on the front and on the sides. So notice in this Eastern sarcophagus, uh, the woman is reclining on a bed, or klein, that's the word we take the word decline, recline from, uh, and how it resembles our famous Etruscan sarcophagus that shows up so often, hint, hint, on the AP test. Uh, in Roman Egypt, death masks are being replaced by death portraits in encaustic. Again, to remind you, encaustic is pigment that's mixed with hot wax and then painted onto wood or stone. It, again, is a frequent AP art history question. Uh, civil war broke out when Marcus Aurelius' son Commodus died, and eventually an African-born general, Septimus Severus, seized power. Note that this portrait was painted in tempera, which is pigment suspended in egg yolk. We'll see more of that as the course goes on. Uh, it was also painted in the round, and that's what's called tondo form. So here are a couple of vocabulary words illustrated. Uh, and here we see a portrait bust of Septimus Severus' son, Caracalla. He was just as ruthless as he looks. He had his own brother and later his own wife murdered. Charming fellow. Again, note that the artist has not bothered to disguise either Caracalla's suspicious nature or, frankly, his mean streak. This is verism, but not the verism that portrays age and virtue. It's telling it like it is, even if that's attract unattractive or even a little scary. Uh, here we see still another triumphal arch with uh, Septimus Severus, but we're seeing again a decline in the classical tradition and a replacement uh, with almost more Eastern forms. And again, the Eastern portion of the empire is increasing in importance during this period. So note the hierarchy of scale. 
the floating figures and how frontal they are. Again, this is a return to Eastern traditions and maybe in part also to Greek archaic style. And again, we're seeing what has long been the art of ordinary people being embraced by emperors, uh, translated into actual imperial art. Uh, Caracalla's most lasting contribution to Rome was this enormous bath complex, which you can still visit today, by the way. It's very cool, although, of course, it's in ruins. Uh, the baths covered um, almost 50 acres. They could house thousands of bathers, swimmers, exercisers. The palestra was the gym. The natatio was the swimming pool. After exercising, Romans would move from the Frigidarium, which, as you might expect from the name, had cold water, to the somewhat warmer Tepidarium. We still use the word tepid for lukewarm water. And then finally to the halt hot caldarium. By the way, standards of cleanliness would not return to Roman levels until the late 19th century. I should have been building those before, sorry. Ah, and now the maps begin to shrink. Uh, I mentioned that Tra well, Trajan took the empire to its greatest geographical extent. Trajan's successor, Hadrian, actually pulled the frontier back to the Euphrates. Uh, and this latest phase of Pax Romana then lasted until the murder of Commodus, uh, the last adopted emperor. Severus' dynasty maintained stability until 235, but there were clear signs of decay. So, for example, the coinage was repeatedly debased. Basically, they put fewer, less and less precious metal into the coins from about 170 CE onwards because the emperors were basically trying to pay their debts uh, with less valuable currency. In 212, all free men in the empire were made citizens, but rather than being a sign of democracy, this was really just an attempt to increase the tax base and get more money out of ordinary people. And it failed to halt the economic decline or the political decline. So in the half century after 235, there were 15 emperors, and most of them only ruled for a few years before they were killed or overthrown. These are the so-called soldier emperors. Some actually died in their beds. Uh, meanwhile, Rome's enemies were becoming more powerful. In the east, the Parthians had been replaced uh, by the Sassanid Persians in 226. Uh, and this is a group that sought to restore the glory of the Persian Empire. They sacked Antioch in 253 and took, actually took the Emperor Valerian prisoner. Uh, at the same time, Germans were raiding deep into the empire in Europe, and they even reached the Mediterranean at several points. Uh, the empire's impotence in turn prompted a number of regional commanders to seize control in the worst affected areas. Uh, this portrait bu portrait bust of one of the so-called soldier emperors, Trajan Decius, again signals a return to the veristic style, but again, it captures uh, the political turmoil and the anxiety of the late Roman Empire. Uh, those Roman Republicans did not look anxious. They did not look as if they thought their country was moving into decline. But this is not an emperor triumphant. Uh, nor is this particular soldier emperor an idealized youth. Yes, he's sculpted nude, uh, but this hero looks more like a thug than a young god. Uh, the statue conveys raw power, and that's what it's meant to convey. You saw an excellent podcast describing this work, so I'll hit just a few points in review. First, the composition is chaotic. This work is not intended to capture an orderly, smooth procession or a victory march where the emperors are in control. The Romans are winning in this particular battle, but they no longer always win. Once again, we see the figures floating in space. The ground line has largely disappeared. Another sign of the move toward late uh, antique style is the symbol on the young commander's forehead. It seems to indicate he's embraced one of the Eastern mystery religions that are becoming increasingly popular in Rome. This one is the worship of Mithras, who's a, who's a Persian god. Uh, and as Rome faced more dangers both inside and outside the empire, more and more Romans were finding that the old gods just were not adequate for their spiritual needs. One of the new religions from the East, of course, was Christianity. <laughs> 
Uh, other Romans sought comfort in philosophy, including Greek philosophy, really especially Greek philosophy. But notice that although in many ways this seems like a classical uh, portrait, note the very dramatically portrayed drapery, uh, that you have this grouping with a central figure surrounded by acolytes who are turned toward him. Again, we're going to see this compositional style carried forward in Christian art. Uh, and here we have the Antipantheon. It's almost a parody of orderly Roman architecture. There are five Corinthian columns. Why five? Which is clearly asymmetrical. The platform is scalloped, and so is the entablature. No more elegant rectangles. Uh, this is architecture embracing eccentricity, you know, going for the crazy, if you will. Uh, but the empire wasn't quite done yet, and it even enjoyed something of revival under the emperor Diocletian, uh, who ruled from 284 to 306 BCE, although I'd note that inflation and the decline in value of Roman coins really continued uh, very rapidly under this particular emperor. But at any rate, Diocletian divided the empire into two parts, east and west, each under what he called an Augustus. Uh, and then he instituted a regular means for succession, the Tetrarchy, which involved naming two junior emperors, the Caesars, who would each serve under an Eastern and Western Augustus. Is that confusing enough for you? Uh, not surprisingly, this rule by Forsum worked only one time when Diocletian retired. After that, civil war broke out because each of the emperors wanted to be the sole emperor or wanted to put down the others. Eventually, Constantine I emerged as the victor, and under his rule, Rome actually reclaimed some of its lost territory. Uh, the revival wouldn't last. Still, Constantine ranks as a major Roman emperor because of two incredibly important decisions that he made. First, he converted to Christianity, and under his dynasty, which lasted until 363 AD, a Christianity became the dominant religion of the empire, and it's going to dominate our story uh, for much of the rest of the course, although uh, not for the next few weeks. Uh, second, Constantine founded New Rome, a Christian capital on the site of Byzantium, and named it Constantinople. Uh, the Eastern Roman Empire would live on for many more centuries and produce some really amazing art. Stay tuned, we will get there. Uh, now we see a portrait sculpture of the four tetrarchs that I just mentioned, the ones who ruled after Diocletian. Uh, it's easy to identify a portrait bust as Hadrian, I uh, noted that the curly beard, or Trajan, or even a particular soldier emperor. But these four emperors are deliberately non-individualized. They're really interchangeable. They've lost their individuality. I mean, clearly this is making a political point. They're meant to rule as a unit. Didn't work very well, but that was the theory. And that theory uh, is being shown in the art, as is so often true about depictions of power and authority. Notice the stylized drapery, what this is called schematic drapery. Uh, it clothes their bodies. It doesn't show their shape. Um, the bodies are rigid, the faces are stern, expressionless. This, again, could almost be a Near Eastern art. Uh, and indeed, the Eastern influence on the Roman Empire was growing, as I mentioned before, even before Constantine relocated the capital to the East. Porphyry, by the way, is a highly valuable and hard-to-carve red marble that was reserved for emperors. We'll see it again in churches, especially when we get to the High Baroque. Well, at first glance, this is just one more triumphal arch, a billboard advertising a Roman emperor's feats. But this billboard, unlike the ones we've seen so far, is made largely of recycled materials, a sort of politically correct billboard. Constantine basically went out and collected relief sculptures from monuments to his favorite emperors and then had them reworked. Uh, his favorites, by the way, were the good emperors. There was a very clear political message. Constantine was attempting to ally himself with emperors that were widely admired to, to bolster his own power and authority. Note the classical composition and figures on the reworked reliefs that are within the circles. Those are the borrowed, recycled elements. Here, on the other hand, uh, you see a couple of friezes that are original, actually one of, I'm going to show you another one in a minute, uh, friezes that are original to this arch. And this one, Constantine is sitting with statues of Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. He's not being subtle. Uh, remember, they were viewed as good emperors. Again, we see the stockier figures, the acolytes surrounding a central figure, the stern expressions of the late empire style. <laughs> 
And then this portion of the frieze on the Arch of Constantine uh, shows similar elements. Notice that Constantine is repeating a theme that appeared on earlier uh, Roman arches of giving out largesse to the population of being the uh, generous emperor. Uh, there's a reason this statue was called the Colossus of Constantine of Constantine. It was huge. The head alone is eight and a half feet high. Uh, the problem with this, as with other monumental statues, such as the carvings of Ramses II at Abu Simbel, is that artistry loses something uh, to size. There's some sacrifice involved in trying to make something this huge. Uh, but even this colossal statue was dwarfed by Constantine's even more colossal basilica, uh, the Basilica Nova. Uh, here we see a cutout plan, the ruins as they look today, and an artist's reconstruction of the interior. Uh, notice the statue in one apse and how, again, uh, it doesn't look that huge in comparison with the size of the entire building. Uh, here's a floor plan. Again, you want to start learning these basilica terms. Uh, the semicircular pr protrusions, again, are the apses. The long central portion of the basilica is the nave with barrel vaults, remember those, forming bays on either side. Uh, a colonnaded porch is the vestibule. And again, as is true with Roman basilica, but not Christian basilicas, the entrance is on the long side. Uh, the Basilica Nova is in ruins now, although you can still get a sense of how gigantic it was. But this palace complex in what is now Trier, Germany, uh, still survives, and it shows the late Roman Basilica style quite well. Well, we're going to end here uh, with the transition to a new world. So the coin on the top was minted near the beginning of Constantine's reign. The second coin, later in his reign, still shows Constantine as imperator or commander. In fact, the shield still bears the symbol of Romulus and Remus. It's still Rome. But instead of a scepter, remember that pole that Augustus was carrying in his statue at Prima Porta? Now we see the emperor carrying a cross. We are moving into the Christian era. But first, we're going to make a detour into Asia to explore Buddhist and Islamic art. <music>